Parts of Haiti are under a state of emergency after an escalation in violence. Gangs have taken control of most of the capital and they want Prime Minister Ariel Henry out. So what's behind this unrest and what will it take to restore long-lasting stability to the country? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Jonah Hull. Haiti's capital is at war. That's the warning from the country's director of national police. Port-au-Prince has been overrun by gangs. A state of emergency has been declared after gang members attacked two prisons, freeing several thousand prisoners. The security situation worsened after President Juvenal Moïse was assassinated three years ago. For months, protesters have been calling for Prime Minister Ariel Henry to step down. They're angry about delayed elections, the rising cost of living and insecurity. The United Nations says the violence forced 300,000 people to leave their homes this year. Well, the Foreign Minister has likened the situation in Haiti to a war zone. To help restore order, the UN has proposed sending a multinational force. So what's led to this crisis and is international intervention the way to resolve it? We'll discuss all of that with our guests in a few minutes. But first, this from Umi Kalsoum Sharif. A country in chaos. <laughs> Heavily armed gangs tried to seize control of Haiti's main airport on Monday, exchanging fire with police and soldiers. The attack is the latest in an explosion of violence that's included the escape of several thousand inmates from the country's two biggest prisons, leaving some dead. Curfew and emergency measures are in place, but the violence is escalating. It's forcing businesses and schools to close and hundreds of people to flee for safety. Since the day I left my house, I've lived like an animal because in the space we sleep, even animals don't sleep there. We're crammed together. Gangs led by Jimmy Cherigier, a former police officer known as Barbecue, are trying to overthrow the government. Prime Minister Ariel Henry traveled overseas trying to get support for a UN-backed security force. But the unrest worsened in his absence. The situation is getting worse. The national police can do nothing against armed gangs. Only a military force can help us in this situation. In 2019, an increase in fuel prices led to protests and escalated into a long drawn out crisis involving job losses, rises in the cost of living and food shortages. More than half of the country's 11 million citizens living under poverty line were affected. Two years later, the assassination of President Jovenel Moïse led to lawlessness that's continued to worsen. Nearly 5,000 people have been killed in the violence in one year, and armed groups now control about 80% of the capital, according to the United Nations. And it's calling for funding to tackle the situation and for elections to be held in Haiti. The Secretary General reiterates the need for urgent action, particularly in providing financial support for the, non, for the um, multi, multinational security support mission to address the pressing security requirements of the Haitian people and prevent the country from plunging further into chaos. The unrest in Haiti is warring neighboring states. The Dominican Republic has refused to open refugee camps for people fleeing Haiti. The U.S. has asked American citizens to leave quickly. But for those left in the country, there's no escape from the reality of what the U.N. describes as catastrophic levels of hunger and violence that are only getting worse. Umikul Sum Sharif, Al Jazeera, for Inside Story. Well, before we go to our panel of experts, let's hear from uh, Ambassador of the Republic of Haiti to the state of Qatar, Francois Guillaume, who joins us from Doha. Very good to have you with us, Ambassador. Your country, sir, is in the grip of anarchy, of gang-led rule, one of its worst crises, certainly in the modern era. Did you ever imagine things could get this bad? Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Hall, first of all, for this invitation to Al Jazeera English. And um, I would also like to first and foremost 
is that my deepest condolences to the families that have fallen prey to this wave of insecurity in Haiti, particularly the valiant and courageous police officers that go out there every day to risk their lives to try to preserve a safe environment for, for us all. In the scope of all of this, we tend to forget that we have some police officers that are going out there every day risking their lives and their valiant efforts has to be recognized. Does it shock you what's to, happening? Uh, it saddens me to say that what is happening right now is not all too shocking. The reason being is for the better part of the last two years, the government and the national police force have been alerting the international community of the risks at bay. We unfortunately have a police force that has not have that has not has the capacity to face this current wave of gang warfare. Doesn't mean doesn't have the tactical capacity. In terms of numbers, we are outnumbered and we are outgunned. Unfortunately, what's happening today is not all that surprising, especially when you have gangs that are coordinating their efforts to thin out the capacity of the police force that's already thin and take advantage of some weak points. Um, it is uh, 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 an outcry, it is sad. However, there is a solution. The National Police Force has a solution to be able to come to a resolution of this insecurity. And the first thing has been, and has been for the past two years, uh, in terms of what we've been advocating for, the government and the police force, the establishment of a collaboration between the national police force and a multinational support to that force. So you believe that an international security force is the answer? or part of the answer? It is definitely part of the answer, and it's only part of the answer. There are many, there are many other um, facets of this security problem. The fact that we have young men and women that are falling prey to gang activities is because they have left, they have been left to no other alternatives than that route. So in, in, in concurrently with security measures, Haiti has to be seen as an area where it has to be invested in, into its citizens. We need to invest more in Haiti. It may be counterintuitive to speak about investment, but Haiti is one of those countries, one of those lands that has the most propensity to lift itself out of this economic, economic doldrum that we find ourselves into. Ambassador, uh, Prime Minister Ariel Henry is out of the country. He went to Kenya to try and resolve the block in getting these security forces uh, into Haiti. Where is the Prime Minister at this moment uh, and when is he planning to make his return? This information has not been disclosed yet in terms of where he is. He definitely left Kenya. I believe if he was up to the Prime Minister, he would have been in Haiti uh, days ago. The current situation in Haiti probably has presented logistical issues for him not being able to be there. However, I do not have the latest information into his whereabouts, but that does not um, this, uh, uh, conclude the fact that he believed that his role and his his place should be in, in front of French right now. Ambassador Francois Guillaume, many thanks for your time Thank and you for, for joining us. Well, let's bring in our panel of experts now from Bordeaux in France. Erwan de Cherisy is with the defence intelligence company Jane's. He was with the UN peacekeeping force in Haiti in 2014. In New York, van der Felbaer brown is director of the initiative on non-state armed actors for the Brookings Institution. And finally, we have Ralph Emmanuel Francois, Haitian social entrepreneur and activist. We're not revealing his location for security reasons. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Ralph, let me ask you, first of all, what is it like for ordinary Haitians now living uh, in the grip of gang-led anarchy, of uh, economic catastrophe, joblessness, hunger, sexual exploitation, murder, atrocities committed on the streets? This is um, a very sad situation for our country now. And... Uh... It is hard to imagine, and the level, the, the emotions that we're having now, fear, um, sadness, um, pessimistic, man, 
it's it's really hard to imagine. It's an uncertainty. Is you know you're not able to project your life and to say that okay, in 24 hours I will be in this location. In 24 hours I'll be there. I'll be there. And you know every t- every day that you have a, a family member um, coming back from the streets, it's like a party. Um, it's 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 really difficult to you know project life in such a chaos. People and, living in a uh, constant uh, state of insecurity and uncertainty. Very uncertain. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is a uh, very hard, and, and I believe the, the some communities are held hostage. And um, I don't know. And you've seen what happened in, in terms of response from the government. Uh, they've taken curfew measures and everything, but they have not been able, you know, to communicate appropriately. And right. and and in times of crisis, the least that we should, the least that we should expect um, from our political leaders is to hide. You know, from the window is not and not taking responsibility. Um, at least we've been waiting for um, communication, like face to face, where our prime minister um, should be, you know, in place um, in front of TV and telling people what their plans are. You know, for the next twenty four hours, for the next seventy two mm. hours, mm. and how they're going to deal with the situation. Okay. Well, Van der Felber you know, Brown. Yeah. A, a, a picture of p- political failure, social dysfunction, and of course, rule by gangs there with your speci- speciality uh, in non state actors, uh, in other words, armed groups like gangs, and with, with a specific focus, I know, on Haitian gangs. Tell us, how did they become so powerful, if essentially defeating the mechanisms of state? Well, for decades, Haiti has had a rule that's very exclusionary, very sheltered on uh, bringing economic and political benefits to a very narrow class of people, uh, while the vast majority of the population has been essentially left to fend for itself. And for decades, also, businessmen and politicians in Haiti, often at the highest level, have been using gangs for their political and economic purposes to intimidate and coerce their rivals. Over time, however, the gangs have slipped the leash and they have become far more powerful, far more organized uh, and uh, far more ambitious. Partially this stems from uh, their access to heavier weapons, but partially this is the socialization, the learning they had through decades of interacting with the political system that has been using them for their purposes. And this is now taking place in a context where Haiti has not had a legitimate government um, for two years, uh, President uh, Moïse was um, assassinated, uh, and since then, uh, uh, Prime Minister Ariel Henry has assumed the office of the Prime Minister. Um, he was never elected. There was all along significant political opposition to his rule. He promised that by February 2024 he would hold elections. That was not uh, done for many reasons, mm. uh, including a business security situation. And so we're in a context of a government that is weak, where um, mm. police forces are politicized and collapsed, where gangs have long used their power to interact and coerce the political system and now are more and more ambitious, and where conditions for ordinary Haitians are absolutely hellish. So it, it, essentially collusion with politics and politicians produced a monster and the monster escaped the cage. Oh, and de Cherisy. Exactly. Uh, you you have experience of African forces, their makeup and expertise. You also have experience on the ground in Haiti with MINUSTA, the UN uh, peacekeeping force in 2014. I want to ask you, is it appropriate to be drawing a security force from African countries to be brought to Haiti? Shouldn't it be people closer to hand with a better knowledge of the situation in the country, perhaps Latin countries or the Caribbean or the United States even? So the um, African countries have been involved in MINUSTA. They provided some police contingents. They speak French, and there is some uh, cultural connection with the Haitian people. So involvement of African forces would likely have some positive elements. The problem, as you mentioned, is that they do not have experience on the ground. Uh, The type of operations they would be having to conduct in Port-au-Prince would mostly be urban operations. 
for which, uh, for example, the Kenya police has no major experience. Uh, Latin American countries were significantly involved in MINUSTA. They have a, a lot of experience in Haiti. They know the lay of the land. They would definitely be uh, a, a better option, probably uh, on account of their experience. The problem is that not many of them are eager to join. Uh, to date, among the countries that have committed themselves to the possibility of joining the force are a number of Caribbean countries, including Jamaica, Guyana, Bahamas, Belize. Uh, actually, Jamaica has a lot of experience in uh, urban operations in the kind of setting that uh, uh, that could be Port-au-Prince, fighting uh, gangs in uh, Kingston, and uh, would probably uh, be very well suited uh, to operations in okay. Haiti. The problem is uh, they can't commit large number of personnel. Okay, Ralph. What, with all of that in mind. I mean, do you think your country would welcome an international security force now, particularly given the legacy of MINUSTA uh, that ended in 2017? There was sexual exploitation, allegations made against those UN peacekeepers, a cholera epidemic that killed 10,000 people that came out of their camps. Um, obviously, we need the use of force. We need the use of force. But I believe, I strongly believe, without a political strategy, the use of force will not be effective. Mm. And it showed that in the past, for example, in 2004, the epicenter of the complex situation in terms of gang violence was Cité Soleil. Cité Soleil is a slum um, on the outskirts, outskirts of Port-au-Prince of 300,000 people at this time. And we had um, around 10,000 soldiers there. And actually, we are in 2024, 20 years later, and we don't have only one epicenter of the violence mm -hmm. for now. We have more epicenters. So, and also the situation is much more complex for many reasons. One of the reasons is in 2004, the gangs was, uh, were more less autonomous. Now they have mostly a total control of our maritime, you know, circumference in the country, mm. maritime. So it is much more complex. And they are localized in some parts of border prince, which, which means that, of course, there will be boots on the ground, but we need a political strategy because we should anticipate civil casualties. Sure. And for civil casualties, we should anticipate also rapid humanitarian response. R Ralph, let, let, me bring, let me bring Vanda in on that. I mean, is there a risk that sending 5,000 troops from Africa into Haiti under these circumstances is at best a very, very temporary solution without a wider plan? Well, absolutely. Um, it is a temporary solution, and I think that everyone understands that the uh, MSS is meant to provide um, security environment to both enable the political process to move forward um, certainly at least toward elections, so that there is some legitimate elected body in Haiti, but also to enable the reconstruction of the Haitian police force, which nominally is somewhere around 9,000 men in practice. If 3,000 are operational at any day, that's, a, that's probably a high number. Um, nonetheless, there are many challenges for uh, the MSS, uh, some of which have to do with uh, the number of personnel, as was already mentioned. It's not inevitable that we actually have 5,000 um, forces. Mm. What kind of uh, rules of engagement they will have? Will they take an offensive fight toward the gangs? Will they be in a static position, simply uh, perhaps uh, protecting the main road between the airport and the uh, porch terminal to a central part of Port-au-Prince? Very many questions, a massive amount of uncertainty in what is no doubt going to be a very complex mission lasting for a very long time, or at minimum, it will last a very long time to um, uh, subdue the gangs to uh, a level of um, security and, that doesn't simply explode the moment the troops leave. And, and, and not a benign mission. I mean, we're talking about a violent mission, essentially. Uh, Erwan, I want to bring you in on this. I mean, in Africa, you'll be perfectly aware, aware abundantly so, I'm sure, of the activities of groups like Wagner. And I wonder whether, in the absence of uh, the willingness or ability of countries to actually 
properly police the situation in Haiti, whether you can see or foresee the possibility that the Russians get involved here on a different basis, on a different level? Uh, I don't see the Russians as deploying Wagner or any kind of direct uh, uh, presence in Haiti. It, it would be quite uh, complex uh, and uh, it would not necessarily advance their uh, aims significantly. However, using uh, internet media campaign, disinformation campaigns that they've done so aptly in Africa over the past uh, couple of years, they could definitely sow further uh, dissension, uh, creating uh, a, an even more significant humanitarian crisis on the doorstep of the United States mm. uh, and uh, distracting the attention of the United States in terms of uh, its security commitments and uh, potentially military commitments away from uh, Europe, away from China, away from, uh, from Gaza. Vanda, I want to ask you, you talk about a political framework and, 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 and so on. I mean, if we assume that the gangs are so infiltrated into Haitian society that there is such a degree of collusion between the gangs and politics, do we have to assume that the political future of Haiti, at least the foreseeable one, will have to on some basis include those gangs, possibly that political leadership will come from the gangs? And I wonder, for instance, who is Jimmy Barbecue Cherizier? Is he a man who can be negotiated with? Is he a man who could rise to political leadership? So there are enormous controversies uh, in Haiti about the questions you're asking. Very large number of people have suffered terribly and they hate the idea of any kind of negotiations with uh, the gangs and with their leaders. Of course, Haiti has a decades long tradition of such negotiations taking place that has simply resulted in empowering the gangs. So one can negotiate in ways that, dam that reduce the damage or augment uh, the damage. I mean, certainly the nature of the negotiations will very much depend on how powerful the MSS is and what kind of security uh, effects it manages to generate on the ground. If the international force um, is very weak, accomplishes perhaps only holding some of the key infrastructures, and the gangs continue to rule the rest of Port-au-Prince, that any kind of negotiations would be weak and the gangs would well uh, ask for uh, political power. Uh, barbecue, Jimmy Cherizier, is a former police officer. Uh, he uh, certainly has been very politically active. He's perhaps uh, the most politically, uh, openly politically active uh, of the gang leaders. Other gang leaders serve politicians, defect from their political alliances. Cherizia is himself personally uh, politically um, ambitious. And the latest um, several days of violence, we have uh, had uh, Cherizia saying that he is again trying to bring down the government of Prime Minister Henri. Hmm. Ralph was shaking his head I, there. Like and, I, and I'll come to you in a... OK, go on, Ralph. I'd like to put a word there. Yeah, go on. Barbecue is a, is a criminal. He's a criminal. I know he's, he's very intelligent and he's been pushing for, you know, communication and to present himself to have like a, a poster um, as a leader. But he's a criminal. And the biggest, the biggest mistake that we should avoid is to validate the gang members as negotiation actors. They are criminals. And that's the reason I'm saying that of course, we need the use of force, but without political strategy, a clear, precise, intelligent political strategy that addresses first to provide the essentials of peace, mm. second, a humanitarian plan to address a five or around five million people um, for food and security, and last, a clear path. Um, to election, credible election. Okay. So the political uh, frame is actually very important. It's utmost at this moment. No I'm gonna, negotiation with the gang members. No I'm, negotiation with I'm the gang members. I'm going to bounce back to you in a second. I'm going to bounce back to you in a second for a final thought, Ralph, on this, but I just want to bring Vander in. What about Prime Minister Ariel Henry? He's about to make a reappearance, we think, in Haiti any day now. How will he be received? He will be at presumably great risk. 
And does he have anything politically, do you think, to offer, given that he's essentially discredited and mistrusted? So far, uh, Prime Minister Andri has not been willing to step down. A lot of the political efforts in Haiti have centered on in the negotiations with him, uh, such as through the opposition groups around what used to be the Montana group, a coalition of uh, civil society and various political parties, other political parties. He still remains a very important actor, even in um, simply stepping down. Of course, if he were just to step down right now, there is a significant challenge of who will emerge as uh, the leader without elections, which cannot be held uh, under uh, the current circumstances. So until he left uh, for Kenya, he continued saying um, he would stay in office and elections would be held in about a year's time. Um, yet, it's as, as Ralph was saying earlier, I mean, there is a sense of increasing by the day, mm. by the hour, as a result of the latest violence, uh, that uh, even his own authority uh, has uh, radically collapsed. Seeped away. Ralph, I, I want to bring you in for a final thought here and, 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 and bring us back down to a community level in Haiti, in Haiti the people of Haiti. Uh, as you spoke about the way they live in such fearful and uncertain uh, conditions. Uh, brutality also, though, creeping into society with the rule of the gangs and in, in the way that people relate to one another within communities and within society. How on earth will your country and its communities and its people survive, uh, survive and recover from all of this? They will and we will. We are very optimistic. And uh, if you look at our history, we've had so uh, many hurdles um, and so many times, of course, we have many people that have lost uh, the family members. This is a complex situations. But I strongly believe that we could get back. Listen, Haiti is a youthful country. Um, almost half of the population is under 18 years old. Mm -hmm. So whenever you have youngsters, you have hope. And uh, I understand also there's a generational conflict. And uh, I understand that some communities are held hostage, but we must come back and we should come back. But I uh, also, I would like to underline, without a political strategy, the use of force will be very ineffective. And uh, I would ask the government, I would ask Prime, Prime Minister Ariel Henry, please make it easy for us. Mm -hmm. If you cannot, take your responsibility it shows that you've been here for almost three years you have the first argument nothing delivered second argument nothing delivered please step back okay. let's come together okay. you know, let's come together and present your resignation and participate in a political process that should help the country okay. An, an, important, an important appeal there. Many thanks to you, Ralph, and thanks to all of our guests. Initially, Ambassador Francois Guillaume, of course, Owen de Cherisy, Van der Felbert-Brown and Ralph Emmanuel Francois. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Jonah Hull, and the whole team here, it's goodbye for now.